when we're moving towards my my presentation, then of course it's actually quite interesting distinction between non-restraining and restraining rights. Because in, in in a way, I would say that all rights are not restraining. Because when you look at this from data subject perspective, then you have rights, and usually you have to have another party who has obligations, and and so this the other party which has obligations is the controller, and 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 very often. When universities researchers do research, they use uh, personal data, and this makes them controllers because they decide what to do with personal data. Uh, they decide how to do um, different like proce processing activities and so on. And and and, and actually, 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 another another good point which um, uh, which Powell made was that uh, concerning these very high fines. When it comes to personal data violations, and and in a way, actually, I think that this uh, GDPR is very well marketed by um, these very high fines. Uh, I'm not. I, I I don't think that uh, being in academia makes you immune to all these fines, but to some, it, it gives you like uh, at least very small immunity because it's when when you are doing it from some private sector, you are doing it for money. It's most likely you get into trouble. But 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 I'm not saying that at academia you are out of the trouble, but but you are more in, in gray area because uh, uh, because academics uh, are considered like I don't know like better people. They are doing good things. They they do it for public goods. They are not doing it for money, and that's so it's not. But it's more psychological argument than um, uh, uh, than um, a legal argument. Anyway, this non-restraining rights. I think that uh, before we move to these rights like this access, right to access, and and right to um, right to uh, and, and, and other rights. I think that most important and um, most important principle which affects all these rights is transparency. And it's not only my idea, but it's also in GDPR, which says that uh, data should be processed in transparent manner. Because the reality is that uh, if data subject, if data subject, if the person whose data is processed doesn't have any idea that the data is processed. And it's not possible to get any idea. Then actually, all these other rights are irrelevant. When when this processing is not transparent, then how can I exercise my right of access? Because I have no idea that my data is processed, or or even though when I um, like um, the data is obtained from me, maybe I don't understand that it's processed. It's all these contracts are so complicated, uh, and and even when you just look at your own behavior when you are doing something online, you just click on everything that you accept, accept, accept. And actually, the reality is that you have no idea what, what they do with your data, and and therefore and therefore there is this uh, transparency requirement, which means that uh, data processing should be transparent. Which means that it should be like easily accessible, plain in language. Maybe you can use some standardized icons, like for instance, Creative Commons has. So why not for um, uh, for data protection, free of free of charge. Of course, but, uh, but but there is another another important aspect um, about transparency. Actually, uh, transparency doesn't remedy all problems. It's 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 not enough. When, for instance, I'm very transparent about GDPR violation, I explain in detail how I violate GDPR or what I do. But it, it it's it's not enough. I cannot violate it. It's it's only requirement that I have to be transparent. I have to exp explain what I am doing. But it's not remedy that, for instance. I switch between different legal grounds for processing. First, I used consent, then I changed my mind, say now I'm relying on legitimate interest or on public interest research, and then I'm very transparent or just violate some other principles. This, this transparency is important, but it uh, doesn't um, uh, doesn't lift any other obligations. I still I still need uh, to follow other obligations. And and yes, basically this transparency is about provision of information. Uh, to data subjects about communication, and it's in a way it's like prerequisite for exercise of uh, data subjects' rights. So, Pavel, could you help? Okay, thank you. Uh, another another thing is that uh, uh, although I need to be transparent, no, I mean that the controller needs to be transparent. At the same time, I don't, uh, the controller doesn't have obligations that to maintain all data. Actually, on the contrary. There is data minimization principle, which says that you should keep as little data as possible. And so it's not that I start collecting information so that I can be transparent. It could be, uh, this could be like violation of personal data protection. 
in order to be transparent, I don't have to collect the data. So, so basically, it's not violation. And, and that, that, that's what GDPR also says, that you, uh, when there is a data you don't require, you can delete it. It's, it's, you don't have to keep it to guarantee transparency, to guarantee transparency. And, and so the next right, if I remember correctly, that then my good colleague and friend Paolo named this right, uh, this like right, mother of all rights, mother of all rights. I don't know, maybe this transparency was father of all rights. I don't know, it's, it's a question of debate, but yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the reality is that you cannot exercise, you need knowledge, and you, if, when you don't have knowledge, then it's not possible to exercise any, any rights. And, and yes, I, I think that I agree with Paul, yes, in a way it's like mother of all rights, but, but I actually even before, before actually you can ex exercise this uh, right to be informed, this access right, then they actually have to have this information. It's like you know, you, you, uh, processing has to be transparent. And yes, when you look at this catalog, what, um, what kind of information should be provided, uh, it, it looks technical, but in reality, it's not so technical. Of course, what they do in GDPR, they distinguish two situations. One situation is that when data is collected from data subject or observing data subject. And, and the other one is that it's somehow collected, not directly from, and, and so, so there, there are like different obligations. And there, there is a slight difference, but, but still, Still, when you're processing data, it makes sense that when I'm using like information which concerns you, it, it makes sense that I have to reveal my identity. It wouldn't make, it wouldn't make any sense that I, reveal, I, I say that, no, I'm not telling you who I am. I'm pro processing your data, but I'm not telling who I am and how you can contact me. Basically, you have to identify yourself as a, I mean, the controller. Like the university has to like, for instance, when university is um, collecting this data, processing it data, it has to say that, this, uh, it's, it's this university, this is address, this is how to contact. And of course, it's not like, um, it's also very technical, it's purpose and legal basis for processing. But, but in a simple way, actually, you have to say that what you're doing with the data, because you could have very, uh, you could have very detailed and technical description, but, but in a way, I think that it's still in violates GDPR because people don't understand. And, and they say that this is like legal basis and purposes and, and very technical description, actually, it should be, uh, explained in a clear way that we are collecting your data, so we try to understand how language functions. Of course, when you plan to transfer the data, you should say it. Uh, uh, what kind of when when the data is not um, is not coll collected from data subject directly, then you should say that what kind of what categories data you are collecting because of this sensitive uh, sensitive personal data, at, and so to say, not sensitive. But um, of course, actually, this distinction is quite complicated, but I won't go, go into, in, into this. Sometimes it's very hard to say, and, and sometimes it's hard to say why some data is sensitive and some other data is not sensitive. But, 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 but anyway, so, so much about this, uh, so, so much about this uh, right to be informed. And I think that when it, comes to, when it comes to research, then researchers are more interested in exceptions than rights. Because usually all this GDPR, all intellectual property, it's like restricts research. Basically, it doesn't uh, doesn't give you like more freedom, but usually it restricts. And, um, and 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 therefore, actually, these exceptions which limit rights are really important. Are really important. And and so these exceptions they concern the information which is provided to data subject. And and then what 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 the GDPR requires says that when the data subject already has the information. When data subject already has the information, you don't have to give it. Uh, you, you don't have to give it again and again and again. But, but, but the idea is that data subject should have this information. Of course, there are other, other, other cases when you don't have to provide information. First case is that it's impossible, especially in research context. But, but this impossibility, I think that it should be restricted. Uh, it, it should be interpreted restrictively. It, it isn't that it's inconvenient for me. It's, Actually, actually, we have a saying in Estonia that uh, you cannot be a little bit pregnant. So basically, you are pregnant or you are not pregnant. And the same is with impossibility. Whether you can do, whether you can provide the information, or, or you cannot. When it's like inconvenient, then it's another matter. But whether it's possible or not. And the other ground, which is most likely which researchers could use, because this impossibility, I don't know, you have seen like many commercials which say that nothing is impossible. Basically, when you like dedicate a lot of effort, you can, but the question is that how much should you go when it's reasonable? 
because actually this uh, the same problem is when you are defining what personal data is because you can always ask that what personal then when i say that it's like raining outside is it personal data or not because somehow it could lead to some like individuals and then so you can you can interpret that everything is personal data and that, that, of course it's the same with impossibility and but 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 i think that the next ground is which uh, says that it involves this disproportionate effort. I think that it's more applicable um, in research context, which means that it, in a way it's possible, but it's like too complicated. And uh, when 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 I think that when it should be the case, it it it, it probably it's can't be the case when I'm just interviewing some data subject and say that it's like too complicated to give you more information. So it's, it should be uh, pro probably you can use it in some legacy data. I don't know. In Estonia, we have a lot of data, like some students have collected some oral traditions using this old style uh, tape recorders going from one village to another in like 70s, 60s, and you have no idea, uh, no idea who to contact, how to contact. In principle, it's possible. You, ca you cannot say that it's not possible, but, but actually it's so expensive and actually it's like blocks using all this, um, all this material. And, and in this context, I would say that concerning this legacy data, I would say that no, uh, it's like disproportionate. It's, it's not really worth of this effort. Of course, at the same time, when you say that it's disproportionate, then it should be some kind of analysis. So uh, there, are no, uh, th there are no good approach, but I would say that uh, you have to estimate uh, whether uh, which which is which situation is uh, like whether, whether you should try to contact data subject or you shouldn't and and how this affects data subject when there is this kind of data when there is this kind of data which could like harm the person then 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 probably you have like more obligations because personal data covers so different information and some information, for instance, concerning some use of dialects and so on, it's, it's still personal data, it's still per voice of the person which is protected, but it's not so like dangerous. But, but when, when it's something, I don't know, for instance, I know about a survey when they collected uh, different stories of suicides in villages. And those are explaining, yes, my neighbor committed a suicide and so on. And, and all these names are like, uh, persons are named and so on. I think that this kind of data, it, it should be, actually, even, even here, I think that this transparency doesn't help. You should try to remove this kind of data because, but, but you don't need, need to name all these people. But, but anyway, the other ground that when it seriously impairs objective, I think it's not really relevant for researchers because the idea is, I, I think uh, mostly it concerns like some kind of work of enforcement agencies or uh, when there is like money laundering, it's, it's not realistic that you contact uh, some criminal suspect and say that in order to respect your privacy rights, now we are informing that we are looking into our business affairs, whether they are like conducting some money laundering or not. Uh, another ground obtained or disclosing is expressly laid down in law. That's, uh, I, I actually, it's like wider principle uh, when it comes to data protection, because the data protection law, it's not only GDPR, but almost all legal acts in, in a national state contain data protection rules because like for instance like tax laws contain data protection rules how data is processed and so on actually it's 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 very wide area and there could be there could be specific regulations and confidentiality by virtue of secrecy i think that it's like quite like like doctors and lawyers and those who are not your friends as Paul indicated but anyway so can you help Paul me with next slide anyway measures measures uh, uh, measures and this exceptions to the right to be informed and what measures should be taken. When you cannot contact person, what can you do? You can make the information publicly available. You can make it publicly available on your website. I don't know, it's case specific. Uh, of course, you can do data protection impact assessment. Uh, you can um, try to uh, make the data less personal. Add pseudonyms, uh, minimize data, and of course, all these uh, organizational and uh, security measures, because uh, you have to minimize the impact on data subject. Because the idea is that when you're doing research, you shouldn't harm people. The idea of research is not harming people, but to create generating new, uh, new, um, new knowledge. And usually, I think that as long as you follow research ethics, it's not such a big problem. You, 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 because already research ethics says that you shouldn't like harm people. So, Paul, can you help me? Oh, no, right of access. 
mother of all rights, as Powell said. I don't know, maybe, maybe it is, but uh, mother of all rights. But, but yes, the idea is that uh, uh, when someone is processing your uh, personal data, then you can, then you have the right to say that what you are doing, what kind of information you have. But in a, in a way, actually, in a way, this right is quite interesting because the question is that uh, uh, the question is that uh, uh, what kind of data can you access? Let, let's say I start. A, let, let's say that, for instance, I don't know. I write an essay about Powell. The question is that could Powell like write to me that says that now you are writing essay about Powell? I have access right, but but of course it. Uh, but actually, when when I where I am getting at is that. One thing is, is like, for instance, I have collected information that about, I use Pavel as example, he is organizer of the seminar, so it's actually his, his duty to be used, his, like, his privilege to be used as an example. Anyway, uh, when I collect like, this data, that when, when Pavel was born, where he went to school and so on, but, but when I'm analyzing this data, creating some profile, I'm analyzing this data, and, and then I have assessment that Pavel is really smart. So, can, can he like make this uh, uh, rely on his right of access and say that send me your assessment? You have to tell me whether you consider me smart or not. And and and, and the question is that is this within scope of right of access? But but usual actually in practice happens. Uh, they send they send the information they have. That for instance I have um, when 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 Pavel sends me requ request, then I say that I have this data on your education or your professional activities. But, but usually what, 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 would be, what, what would companies and organizations say is that we don't give you this profiling information because it's already like, um, it's already like our like trade secret or because I remember it was one like Tinder case. Tinder case when person made a re request to Tinder said that give me all information you have on me. And, and, and so basically what happened, Tinder gave all this information the person had entered. But, but then the person asked that, but, but what kind of, why do you like uh, show my profile to one people, to some people and some people you don't show and, and but, but, but then already it was that they said, no, it's already trade secret. We are not sharing this kind of information. And, and, and uh, of course, when it comes to court practice, then it's also interesting. In some cases, they say that like, like legal analysis is not personal data. In some other cases, they are saying that, I mean, the court, uh, European Court of Justice is saying that, yes, that when you are grading a student work or, or some, and, and, and adding some comments, then it's personal data. It's, in, in, in a way, it's like interesting. And uh, deeper you look into these rights, more complicated it becomes, actually. If you don't want to complicate your life, don't try, try not to learn anything. So basically, when you have like very simple understandings, then things are quite simple. More, more deep you look into matters, more complicated it becomes. But anyway, Paul, can you just move our uh, right of access? Now, basically, basically the same catalog. It says that um, uh, this uh, data controller has to like say you know, the purpose of processing categories and recipients and so on. It's it's quite technical, technical uh, list. But the idea is that um, you have you have right to have information who is processing what they are doing what their intentions are, how this could affect you, and so on, it's in, a, in, a, in a very simple way. So I think I'm done with this rectification. Yes, to make data accurate. I don't know, it's, it's, it's also interesting, right? In, in, in a way, of course, there is already this um, general principle. It says that data should be accurate because, uh, because actually personal data is also data which is not accurate. I don't know, for instance, I lie about some person and it's like recorded, it's like personal data. The question is that when I lied, it's like false information, whether it's still, whether it's still like personal data. And, and I, I, I would say, yes, it's personal data, then it's not accurate. But uh, I don't know, but, but is it personal data when I say that someone is bad person? It's, it's not really factual or is it factual? It's actually, we have the same dispute. Soon we could have same dispute here, but we have in, in case law that how can you insult the person when it's, it's like like factual factual data or it's like something like like value judgment when you say you say something and and what kind of data can be rectified because then someone like profiles you and uh, makes a conclusion which you don't really like but I think that this conservative approach could be is that when there is like factual data factual data then it could be it should be like um, rectified but of course I remember there was one interesting case in Estonia. Uh, First, people, two persons who had the same name. And so one was like former KGB agent and the other one was trust, 
lawyer or something. And, 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 and anyway, this lawyer got some national decoration. And there was newspaper article which says that former KGB agent got this like national decoration. And there was like confusion, but but of course it led to this right of Eurasia, actually. So, but 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 actually, in in a way, it was correct, but but it was just the same name. But anyway, so when you process data, it has to be accurate. You have it has to be accurate, and when it's not accurate, you are told to correct. Then you have to do it. It's not that you say that no, no, I'm not doing it. Anyway, maybe you can move forward with. But is it plus one? Ah, data portability. New popular right, but of course um, this data portability, I am not sure how relevant it is to um, uh, to language research. Most likely, it's relevant when you are just moving from one service provider to another, and you want some contact list, and and in a way, it's quite limited too. Basically, it says that uh, uh, basically it, it says that uh, you have to provide uh, uh, the processing is based on consent. Or, um, or, or basically, you have to. It was you who provided the data. It, it was you who provided the data, and and of course, when it comes to portability, portability, then the question is that actually, what is portable? For instance, when I just go to shop and I buy different things, and so I have this like uh, like card which which registers. So I'm just client in this shop, and so they have list what I'm like buying every day, every day, and and I, I I don't know if I want to exercise my uh, portability right to take my shopping list to um, some other shop. Then, then the question, then the question is that what can uh, what can I expect? Probably they can uh, they can, they should give all information on products I am buying. But but let's say that every day uh, the main items what I am buying is like alcohol and cigarettes. Then probably they have very specific profile on me that uh, most likely I'm not like. Uh, uh, I don't have very healthy lifestyle. It could reflect uh, that whether like life insurance is should be give, given to me and so on. And I think that uh, information on this profiling, they wouldn't give to me. Probably what they do, they just give a list of these items, what I'm buying. I don't know, but, but anyway, I think that uh, for research it's not so relevant. Maybe you want to move your data from one, one repository to another. And, and of course, this moving doesn't mean that your data is deleted. So they just keep your data. It, it doesn't matter. Actually, when you, it's two different things. One is portability. I want copy of my data, and the other thing is um, that you can like request deletion. And I don't know. Probably I have used enough your time. And now, Paul, can you tell all secrets about probably this erasure and objection? And, and thank you. Mm -hmm.